Make me holy like you That I may do the things you do Make me holy like you That I may ever feel your fire This message today, guys, is... I have felt that it's probably one of the most important, of, of least of my life in ministry. And it is one that principality-level demonic powers over this nation oppose. And so I've been praying into it, and I've, you know the brother's praying for me before I, got up, before I actually stood up here to preach. I really appreciate that. So Father, I'm asking that this would go out with power. I'm asking, Lord, it would break chains over this church, over this city. I'm asking, Lord, that it would release something that would go out across the country and empower your people and restore things that have been lost. And I say to the powers and the principalities, the Lord rebuke you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. Yeah. The first... The first book my father ever wrote was The Elijah Task. I was in high school when he wrote that book. It's a classic. It's still out there. When he wrote it, he was still a pastor in a local church. But he was developing the inner healing revelations back then and his understanding of prophetic ministry that would carry him around the world in the years that followed that. Foundational to the prophetic message that he called The Elijah Task. This is how he defined the Elijah task, the prophetic task for our day, this is how he defined it from the beginning, from Malachi 4, 5, and 6, which reads, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now listen, before the Lord can return, he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. He considered that to be the foundational prophetic message for our time. Not long after that, he left, he left the pastorate to found Elijah House. Elijah House became a counseling center. It became a counselor training center known all over the world for restoring the Christian family. And again, the foundation was to be the hearts of the fathers restored to the children and the children to the fathers. The Malachi 4 mandate was to be my family legacy. It was to be our family inheritance for life and ministry. And when we planted this church nearly 29 years ago, the Malachi mandate was foundational to us as a church. That was foundation here And for many years, we enjoyed an ongoing connection in this place of young and old walking together, fathers in Christ adopting young people who were fatherless and walking together, fathers in Christ adopting fatherless sons and daughters, worshiping and ministering together. And my father was a great man. He overcame a, a, a broken and hideous upbringing, really to receive a revelation from God and to understand and craft an approach to inner healing and life transformation that has changed uncounted lives all over the world. He passed an unshakable faith and a legacy of understanding to me and my siblings, but his lingering brokenness from his own upbringing rendered him unable to fully put into practice what he taught in relation to us, his children. He could give it to the world but he was never able to fully connect with us, his children. And so by the end of his life, I'm just laying a, found work, uh, I mean a foundation, a, a background for some of this. By the end of his life, as Parkinson's disease weakened him, there was a tearing. Until before he passed away, there, was no long, there were no longer any of us family members associated with Elijah House. And on several occasions, he so wounded me personally that a rift was opened. Our legacy seemed taken from us. And that sets the stage for, what of, for a lot of what I'm saying today. The hammer blow came here to this church two and a half years ago when 18 years of co-laboring with my own son came to an end. It seemed that my father's legacy 
that, that, that which he had, he had worked his entire life to leave as inheritance to his children had been cut off. Again, Malachi prophesied, he will restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the, and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that, so that I will not come and smite the land with a, with a curse. And here's the, here's the rule, here's the principle. When you reject or cut off the legacy of the fathers to the children, when you cut off the inheritance, then what happens is you cut off the power of the anointing. You cut off the blessing that would come with it. Wow. And that principle, that's troubled me for a long time, and not just for myself and my family. I've never let go of the Malachi 4 mandate. I have never let that go, and I never will. It is my inheritance, and I will not surrender it. It is and it remains a foundational calling for this church. More than that, the Malachi mandate is key to revival in our day. And I'm not hearing it being preached anywhere. It's the foundational key to revival in our day. It is key to the redemption of an entire culture. It's a major word that the prophets should be proclaiming, and I'm afraid they're not. I hear all kinds of other things being preached. I'm not hearing that. And yet it's the last words of the Old Testament. This restoration, I mean, Jesus can't come till that happens. This restoration of holy connection between the generations must come before the Lord will return. If it doesn't, the curse remains. 10 or 15 years before my father passed away, after we had been alienated and distanced from one another for a time, the Lord told me to reconnect with my father. And I obediently did. Not long after that, my father was looking forward to his homecoming to the Lord. He realized that he was getting old and he realized that he needed to, to pass the mantle somehow. That's what he was, he was pondering. Passing the legacy to the next generation. And so he sat down, he talked with me, he asked me if I would carry, and he was almost kind of, kind of almost apologetic about it, kind of humble about it. He asked me if I would carry his prophetic mantle when he was gone. And I told him that I would because I wanted to honor him. But my guard was up. And I know that I didn't fully receive it at the time. In fact, what I told him was I said, yes, Dad, I, 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 I can do that. But because my guard was up, I told him that I would do it. But that I said, Dad, I'm, you got to know that I'm not part of the prophetic movement. <laughs> I'm not part of the prophetic movement. <laughs> That's what I told him. And I think now that was a mistake. Because what he was really doing, I look, I, looking back now, I know what he was really asking my brother Mark and me to do was to step into positions in the wider body of Christ that he knew that he would no longer be able to fill. And neither one of us wanted to do it. And then later, by the time he passed away more than three years ago, some things had happened between us that were so hurtful to me that I had erected some pretty high walls once more. And since he passed away, the Lord has sovereignly brought my father to me in the spirit three times. Once in a vision and twice in dreams, all three times in ways that have been healing. And I know there's some religious spirited people out there that are going to say, oh, that's necromancy. He's talking to dead people. Oh, well, <laughs> so, so for the sake of those who would take that stance, let me clarify some things. I didn't initiate those encounters. Because to do that, that would be forbidden occult necromancy. Those encounters were initiated by God's sovereign hand in the same way that I think God sent Moses and Elijah to meet with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration in the presence of Peter, James, and John. 
God initiated those things. I don't want to take time to describe those encounters. That would be personal for me in a public setting like this. But I want to tell you that in those encounters with my father, there was, there was forgiveness, there was repentance, and there's been healing. I want you all to realize, I want all of you to realize, because I know that there's probably not a person sitting here that doesn't have some wounds in relation to a father. And I want you to realize that your heart, your heart can be restored even to your deceased father. You might be saying, well, my father is dead. How can my heart be restored to him? Your heart can be restored even to your deceased father, no matter how hurtful the relationship might have been through simple forgiveness and making a choice to honor him and focus on the good parts of the legacy he left you rather than feeding on the hurts and the wounds. And I hope you understand what I'm saying. I don't care how bad he was. He left you something. Something. And so all of this that I'm telling you has led me to a vitally important God encounter I had in the gym of all places. You know, God will ambush you wherever your guard is down. <laughs> so this was during a workout just a couple of weeks ago. And I know it's part of restoring the hearts of the fathers to the children, children to the fathers. I know that that God encounter that I had affects not just me, but the destiny of this church, and by extension, all of you and everyone that I and we as a people will touch in this city and internationally. Because if you think that we're destined to be a nice small church on the north end of Denver, you better think again. Amen. So right in the middle of a set of bicep curls, <laughs> I suddenly felt the force of of the anointing and the authority my father carried from the Lord impact me in the chest. And it was a big deal because he's known the world over. And instantly I knew I needed to pray. Because although I had said yes to my father years ago when he asked me if I would take his mantle, I had held back and I knew I'd held back. And this time I knew I needed to receive it fully and I knew I needed to plumb the depths of it. It was tied to receiving the Malachi prophetic Elijah mandate and I knew that it would carry insight and revelation and authority, responsibility and wisdom and exposure in the wider world. And it would affect all of you. And would, it, would, it would extend to whatever impact that we all as a church are called to have on the wider body of Christ. And so I'm determined, I'm determined to resurrect and restore something that the enemy has fought hard to destroy across this nation, in the body of Christ, in my family, and in this church. And I think it's time to get royally pissed about it. It was a foundational value from the, in this church from day one. The restoration of the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children to the fathers, connecting the generations, the passing of the prophetic legacy from my father, and the connecting of the generations. Calls to mind an encounter I had in Toronto way back during, I mean, I, probably 20 years ago during the height of the Toronto revival, and all of us, I'm hearing somebody talking from the platform about how we gotta start youth churches. And I got really angry, and I made my way up to the front, and I got in John Arnott's face, and I said, we don't need youth churches. That's the wrong way to go. Unbiblical. You separate the generations, this revival's over. See, unless the Malachi restoration happens, the land labors under a curse. The anointing is hindered. Full release of revival cannot happen. And I've said, and I'm in print saying it, never again will there be a revival that affects or touches only a single generation. 
That is not God's plan. God never intended the generations to be separated. God's vision was always for the generations to be connected and to move together in oneness. From the very beginning, when God first called Israel out of Egypt, he established a three-generational connected vision. And it was founded on the inheritance, and this is where I'm probably going to get in trouble in this culture, and I don't care, have at me. An inheritance passed down through the father's line. The hearts of the fathers restored to the children. Deuteronomy 6. This is how far back it goes. Now this is the verse, starting at verse 1. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you're going over to possess it, Listen, so that you, your son, and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life that your days may be prolonged. You, your son, and your grandson, the male line through the fathers. You break that and you're done. Verse three, O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Always, throughout the history of God's people, it was a heritage and an identity to be passed from father to son through headship, through the father's line, generation after generation, releasing blessing and power upon families, peoples, and nations. If you want to argue about that, you argue with the boss. Never, never did God envision the generations to walk separately. In Acts 10, the Roman centurion Cornelius came to the Lord with his whole household. In Acts 16, the Philippian jailer came to the Lord with his whole household. Listen to Jeremiah 31, 13. Then the virgin will rejoice in the dance. The virgin is a metaphor for the body of Christ. And the young men and the old together. The young men and the old together. For I will turn their mourning into joy and will comfort them and give them joy for their sorrow. So listen, the church, the people of God can never come into the fullness of power and joy until the young and the old dance together, work together, and minister together. It cannot happen. Not, not in last. Not in be sustained. And whenever this connection and the transmission of that heritage has been, was interrupted in Israel, the curse came down on them. Whether the failure originated on the father's side or in dishonor from the side of the sons, it brought the curse down. And it goes all the way back. Noah built the ark at the command of the Lord before the flood, took his family in it to save them after the flood in Genesis 9. Catch this little story. Verse 20, Noah began farming. He came out of the ark, and Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. I mean, he really tied one on, right? <laughs> Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. They weren't even going to look on their dad's shame. We're not going to expose our father's shame. We're not, we're not even going to look on it. We're not going to judge him. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. So what you get here 
is the dishonor shown to a father, even when it was deserved, resulted in a curse on generations of the son who dishonored him. The sons who covered their father's shame received blessing. Fast forward. When the disconnect happened between King David and his sons, I mean, you know, David, my estimation, King David was too consumed with being king. And he wasn't connected enough with his sons. Besides that, he had a whole gaggle of them because he had too many wives. <laughs> so he got disconnected from his sons. And it resulted in an incestuous rape. Go read the story. So later on, his son Absalom got into a rebellion. Started winning over the hearts of the people. Ah, my dad's not listening to you, and, but I'll listen. So he wins over the hearts of the people, and he foments a rebellion, tries to take the kingship from his dad. And that led to a battle. Absalom actually drives his dad out of Jerusalem and assumes the throne. David has to bring his army and drive Absalom out. He issues orders that Absalom not be killed, and Absalom gets killed anyway. So when the connection between the father and the sons is broken, the curse comes down, and people die, and the kingdom suffers. America, as a nation, is under a curse right now. And the curse is growing. And the cause, the reason for that curse is found in Malachi 4, 5, and 6, where both the promise and the warning are found. I'm going to read it again. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. That's the promise part. Before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Well, first God promises that in the last days he'll bring about a restoration of fatherhood. He'll send a prophetic voice in the last days. That was my father's vision. I think even he lost sight of that before the end. but it's my heritage. That's what the Lord blasted into my spirit in the middle of a set of curls. <laughs> the hearts of the fathers restored to the children, children to the fathers. Absent that, absent a restoration of fathers functioning as fathers, a curse rests on the land. Well, from approximately the 1960s, when we baby boomers, people who were born in the years following World War II, when we rejected the culture of our parents and we effectively dishonored them, or you gotta follow me through this, people. We effectively dishonored, we trashed their morality, didn't we? We trashed their concept of covenant. We trashed their sense of duty. We trashed their idea of order in the home. We trashed their idea of how authority works. I find it really weird that I am now well past twice as old as the people we weren't supposed to trust, remember? Don't trust anybody over 30. That was the cry. And since then, we've seen the value of male influence and maleness itself devalued and even despised. And that's been accelerating ever since that time. In fact, since that time, since we trashed those values that our parents walked by and they led a stable society, since we've trashed that, we have seen a four to six decade long war on masculinity. A four to six decade long war on male authority in general. 
And for now six decades, the enemy of our soul has waged war on masculinity to shame men for being men, to shame men for being strong, to shame men for being aggressive, to shame men for their sexuality, to shame men for exercising the authority that comes instinctively to us as men. The enemy knows that if you destroy men in a culture, you can destroy the culture itself because you'll cut off inheritance, you'll cut off heritage, you'll cut off identity, you'll cut off connection, that is pre- and, and that's precisely what's happening because scripturally, identity and heritage are passed through the male line. Why do you think that every genealogy in the Bible is traced through the male line? As a generation, we tried to exalt women to their rightful place of equality. You can't hang out with Beth and me very long without realizing that the two of us walk in equality, right? But as a generation in this culture, sick culture, what we did was we tried to exalt women to their rightful place of equality, but we did it at the expense of tearing men down. And in the process, we destroyed it for everybody. We actually thought that the only way to achieve equality for women was to destroy the authority of men and fathers. Well, you can never elevate one by bringing another down. That that doesn't work. And now the land labors under a curse as our culture disintegrates around us because the hearts of the fathers are first alienated from themselves and then they're alienated from the children. And so the children are alienated from the fathers. Fatherlessness has become epidemic. Surprise, surprise. On the one hand, men have abdicated their rightful place of authority and leadership, while society as a whole dishonors and disrespects their authority and role. And that's brought confusion to families. It's deprived men of their proper role and position in the family. It's wrecked families. It's set children adrift in a world of confusion. Why? Because identity, destiny, and heritage flow from the Father's line. Who am I? As men have been alienated from themselves, as the bond between them and the younger generation has been broken, as divorce has skyrocketed, fathers have been increasingly absent from the home. You know, more babies are now born in America outside of wedlock than are born into homes with, of married couples. In, in a great many homes, ask Isaiah, in a great many homes where a man is actually present, it's often just a boyfriend or a stepfather and not a real father. We've lied to women, telling women that Somehow they can be all things to their children. And in the process, we've weakened and crippled the women. You know, as a father can't be a mother, a mother can't be a father. Stop lying to ourselves. A mother can't father a son any more than a father's equipped to nurse a baby. I mean, we have nipples, but they don't work. <laughs> I mean, come on. How stupid are we? You know, Scripture, Scripture clearly teaches that while a mother's teaching and a mother's nurture and a mother's influence are essential, identity and destiny come through the Father. That's true. That's true for both sons and daughters. Every genealogy in the Bible, I've said it, traces lineage and inheritance through the Father's line. But since the 60s, because of this disconnect I'm talking of, we've seen the structure of society crumble. So we have sexual dysphoria. We have confusion. When in history have we had this confusion, (coughs) this sexual confusion that's become so epidemic? And rather than recognize and address the root cause of all this in, in all this fatherlessness, the culture wants to call it normal. It's not normal. We have men who think they're women and women who think they're men. Or people who don't know what they are. 
while sexual abuse and pornography have increased exponentially, <coughs> as fatherlessness has increased sexual confusion and perversion, have increased in lockstep with it. And crime is running out of control. It's become fashionable even to, and listen to this one. You wonder why our nation is under a curse? It's become fashionable now to despise the founding fathers of our nation and trash them because they failed to see the implications of the revelations they received that had to do with all men and women being created equal and having the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, their culture blinded them to the full meaning and application of, of what they've received, and so some of them were slaveholders. That's true. That happened. They were sinners. But that doesn't give us the right to trash them and dishonor their legacy and invalidate them altogether and do that without consequence, not without bringing the curse upon us. You understand what I'm saying? That's crazy. They were the fathers of our nation. You can't dishonor them without bringing the curse. You focus on the good they gave us. And you forgive the rest. Disconnect our hearts from the legacy they gave us and we activate the curse and it's going on right now. You can go down to Denver Metro, you, you know, right now, go to college at Denver Metro and you'll hear that going on. See, increasingly our culture judges, condemns, and invalidates them for their sins while failing to honor them for the goodness of the legacy they gave us. And it's tearing our nation apart because it brings the curse. And it plays into the hands of the demonic. You know, if I were to do that kind of thing with my earthly father and invalidate everything he stood for because he was a sinner and because he failed to practice the revelations with us, that he had received and that he could practice with everybody else, if I were to do that kind of thing with him, I would at best be a shadow of the man I am today because I'd cut myself off from the legacy of the good things he passed to me and the legacy of who he was. I can recognize his failings so that I don't repeat them. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But do I want to be so arrogant as to weigh him in the balance and judge his shortcomings? Who do I think I am? See, when we do that, we bring the curse down on ourselves, and that's exactly what's happening to this nation. I won't deny his sins, but it's essential that I honor what he passed to me in righteousness. His gifts, his revelations... And in varying degrees, that's true for every person in this room. Every one of us has or had a sinner for a father. And every one of those sinners gave us something to value and honor. You know, since we as boomers, we older ones, since we came of age and trashed the heritage we'd been handed by our parents who fought and won, who fought and won the most destructive war this world has ever seen. We've seen first the disintegration of family life, and then we've seen rising drug use, and then we've seen increasing riots and lawlessness in our streets, and then we've seen mass shootings, and it's getting worse by the day. And I would challenge you, look closely. Look closely at the riots that are happening and the violence that's going on. It's not old people that are throwing rocks and bottles and setting fires and breaking windows and looting stores. Generally speaking, it's not old people shooting up schools, malls, and workplaces, is it? It's younger people who don't know who they are. It's younger people expressing their rage. It's younger people who've been taught nothing by the previous generation and who are cut off from their true inheritance. It's a generation who either have no fathers or who have had fathers who've been ineffective for lack of knowledge of what it means to be men. And we boomers sowed those seeds. We did. 
And we're going to have to take responsibility for it in repentance. And so the land labors under a curse as the hearts of the fathers are not connected to the children. And the hearts of the children are not connected to the fathers. It's a generation who don't know who they are. It's one of the reasons so many young people choose gangs. It's identity. Church attendance is catastrophically declined in this church, at least in part because men don't know what it means to be godly men. And so they don't lead their families in real spirituality. You realize how Ephesians 6, 1 through 4 actually reads? Check this out. Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Verse 2. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. So children are commanded to honor and obey both parents mother and father, with a promise. Verse 3, so that it may be well with you, that you may live long on the earth. But the next line is specifically aimed at fathers. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So it says, you know, mothers nurture, mothers can discipline, but it's primarily the role of a father to discipline and instruct as part of imparting identity and purpose. And I've looked at whole generations of people that gave instruction and discipline to the mother while the father's abdicated. It's the father's responsibility to discipline and instruct. There were so many times when our kids were growing up where Beth would teach them something, Beth would say something to them, and they didn't believe it until I said it. (laughs) Because whether you want to believe it or not, the authority comes through the male line. Scripturally, that's reality. There can't be any substitute for the heart of a father connecting with his children and their hearts connecting with the father. It's a connection that can be broken on either side. A father can work hard to connect with his children, but if the children fall into judgment and if they allow themselves to focus on imperfections at the expense of the legacy and heritage, then the enemy floods in with the curse. And when the legacy and inheritance are cut off, anointing is hindered and the curse is activated. Inheritance is cut off and blessing is cut off. Really? We boomers, I know I've said some of this before, but I'm going to drive it home. We boomers broke the connection from our side when we failed at honoring our parents and that's been passed on to succeeding generations. And then we moved on to fail at discipline and instruction of our own children because we were too focused on ourselves. I mean, you know, we've some of the succeeding generations, we called them the the generation X or Generation Z. Well, we were generation me. That's what they called us. I can still remember some of the monumentally stupid things we said. To thine own self be true. What brain damage? How dumb were we? If it feels good, do it. Good God. (laughs) You know, until we came along, listen, until we boomers came along, nobody ever talked about a generation gap. It didn't exist. At no point in in the history of, 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 of the world or of our nation, did anybody ever talk about a generation gap? That happened on our watch. We created it. We let it happen. We made it happen between us and our own parents, and we let it happen between us and our children. And you want to say, where's the solution? And I think it's obvious. What we need in the body of Christ is a restoration of the Father's heart, capital F. We need fathers in Christ who will rise up and take their places to release life into those who are fatherless and into the body of Christ. Because the Father's heart releases life. The Father's heart is... See, I'm not talking about... You know, when people start objecting to this, they, talk, they, 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 they want to somehow paint men as being the great danger in the world. You know, the, the, all of the world's problems arise from white men, you know. That's what they'll teach you down at Metro. I mean, really, I'm serious. 
<laughs> the, the real heart of the Father sets people free. It releases life. It's authority to release life, to set people free, to grow into who they are. And I'm not talking about domination or control. It's what releases people to become who they are. It's like pouring fertilizer out on a field and enabling it to grow. <laughs> it's not domination or control. You know, Paul fathered Timothy in the spirit and it released him and freed him and empowered him into his ministry as bishop of the church in Ephesus. And when Timothy began to falter, Paul, because he had a relationship of fathering with him, had the authority to come and kick Timothy's butt and say, get off your butt and do your job, Timothy. <laughs> Remember that? Go read the book. He fathered Titus in the same way. And when Corinth began to get out of line, he could come to Corinth and say, I was your father. Listen to me. <clears throat> begin to issue corrections. Where fathering goes, life is released, wisdom is released, freedom is released, power is released, blessing is released, destiny is released. Elisha, when Elijah was taken into heaven, remember? Elisha cried out, my father, my father. And he received Elijah's mantle and he received the double portion in power and anointing. <coughs> I'm getting so into this, I'm messing my voice up here. So. <laughs> when I look at the body of Christ and the fathering heart being released to the body of Christ, I want to say the body of Christ doesn't need more showmen. We don't, we don't need pastors functioning as CEOs of corporations. We don't need performers. We don't need more motivational speakers. We need fathers. We, need, we don't need prophetic people running around predicting things. We need prophetic voices who will father the body of Christ. We need leaders. We need leaders who, who live not for the sake of their own careers or their own success or their fame or recognition, but who live for the Lord's sake and for the sake of releasing life into the people they lead. <clears throat> we need leaders who are living, you know. <clears throat> Let me go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 is 11 and, 11 and the verses after. It's all about equipping the saints for the work of ministry. Paul wrote about that. And I want you to know Ephesians 4 goes well beyond just teaching skills and models of ministry. That's there, there, there's an impartation of heart and life involved. Ephesians 4, beginning at 11, it reads, He gave some as apostles, Jesus did, and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. By the way, I'm getting real tired of hearing about the fivefold ministry, you know, because it's... I'm sorry. <laughs> it just sounds empty to me anymore. It's like, here's a form. Go work with this form and everything will be right. I'm sorry. I, it doesn't ring with the Father's heart to me. Anyway, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. You see, too often, that's been interpreted as impartation of, of skills and methods and models for doing ministry and putting forms in place. But you take all of those verses in context, and what you see is it's about the release of life to grow into maturity in the Lord and become powerful for him beginning at the level of character. It's about becoming something. And character flows from nurture. It flows from impartation of life from one who carries the heart of a father. 
A lot of the church is drowning in equipping seminars and training courses and how to. Hope people, we're going to those things hoping to find life and destiny and purpose there, and it's all good stuff. But how many of us are actually sitting under a fathering anointing from Father God through leaders who carry the heart of a father? Hello? See, when a generation has lost the concept of fathering because the culture has seen the institution of family and the authority of fathers destroyed, then you see a culture that's disintegrating at every level and you see people living without a sense of purpose. And then you see them real disappointed with church. And you see mental health deteriorating. And you see depression afflicting increasing numbers of people. And you see violence escalating, particularly among the young. And you see crime rates rising. And you see prison populations swelling. And you see drug addiction exploding to epidemic levels. And you see lawlessness in general increasing at every level. The promise is that God will send the spirit and power of Elijah to restore the hearts of the fathers to the children, children to the fathers. Let it begin among God's people. And please God, please God, let the real prophets arise who will move in the spirit and power of Elijah in these last days to restore the hearts of men. And let's honor once more who men are. And let's restore them to their proper place in our homes and churches. And let's let's cultivate churches whose style and character appeal to the masculine heart as well as to the hearts of women. And when I say all of this, I don't know yet what it all looks like. But what I do know is I'm owning the full anointing my father asked me to shoulder so long ago. And we're going to walk in it as a people. Thank you, Lord. Touch my eyes and make me see. Wake me, Lord, from my sleep to hear you.